and gentlemen, to episode number 144 of Let's Go Racing. Tyler Jones, Dominic Avagan, and Jonathan Feld here with you as we are pleased to welcome in the one and only Dave Marcus is here, NASCAR legend himself. We will discuss all the stories that you want to know and need to know when it comes to Dave Marcus coming up in just a few moments from right now. We'll have our news and notes segment with the latest headlines from the world of NASCAR in just a bit. Also, our mailbag segment at the end of today's show as well. Dominic, uh, what, a, what a guest that uh, we're about to have on here with us. But first, we got to talk about Talladega just real quick. What an exciting finish for Tyler Reddick to get that win and to have Michael Jordan finally in victory lane for a 23-11 race. Uh, exciting finish and a, a big day there for that team. And, and it's weird hearing that too, Tyler, the fact that this was the first time Michael Jordan visited victory lane at an NASCAR track. Cause we've seen him. I know you've seen him at the track, Jonathan and myself, we have definitely seen him. He is a presence at the racetrack and he just has this, this crowd around him. Everybody's excited that MJ's at the track. And that's fascinating to me that he hasn't been in any of the wins just yet. So definitely a great celebration. And, and, and you and I were talking about this, Tyler, about Tyler Reddick's son, Bo, getting to, to be with Michael Jordan, spend all that time with him. And, and I think Bob Pockers had asked him on the show last time about, does, does Bo know him as the shoe man or the basketball player? And Tyler Reddick's like, I need to do a better job of showing him highlights. Thank you, Bob. So really cool. Just a, a really good moment for the sport. These are the kind of moments, Tyler, that help the sport have a great life and, and arguably help it grow. When you see Michael Jordan in victory lane, you know, he's all in, in this sport. He grew up a fan of it. So very cool to see Michael Jordan in victory lane celebrating with his team. Yeah, no doubt about it. Jonathan Feld here with us this week. Uh, Jonathan, what was kind of your takeaways from what we saw on Sunday? Well, I thought it was interesting how the manufacturer alliances really work together. I mean, you know, with the Toyotas and, you know, how they seem to have it all figured out until that savage wreck with Eric Jones. And then it still ended up working out well because, I mean, Tyler Reddick went to Victor Lane with that push from Martin Truex Jr. But, man, Ford coming so close for the first time this year. They had everything worked out. They had the strength in numbers. McDowell and Kozlowski got clear so that way they could sell amongst themselves. You just can't block three times at a super speedway track. Yeah. Uh, could have been what could have been for Michael McDowell. Very close there at the end. But ultimately, Tyler Reddick comes out victorious. One more note, Dominic, uh, of the coulda, woulda, shoulda. How about Brad Kislowski? He's been waiting to get back to victory lane. Came oh so close there. Um, what would you think of what happened there with Keselowski with a move that was similar to his first career win there at Talladega? Absolutely. There's, there's a reason he's the active king at Talladega Super Speedway and always up front when it matters at these tracks. Uh, Jonathan and I were there watching the race together and covering it together. And and I was telling Jonathan, you, you, you could tell the way Keselowski laid back in turn three. OK, McDowell's not going to win this race. It's going to be Keselowski or someone else because he laid back. He timed that perfectly, had enough room to clear Tyler Reddick. Now he tried, couldn't get it done. And just the way the cautions flew, I mean, second yet again. And when you look at those numbers, Tyler, it's very fascinating. Kozlowski, since his last win, which came at Talladega in 2021, he's posted 18 top five finishes, 40 top tens. He has led 785 laps in this winless skid. We joke, it's like Bill Elliott, when Bill Elliott had the ownership and didn't win. Kozlowski is putting up really good numbers like Bill Elliott did. I, now, I think we will see Kozlowski get to victory lane, but you got to imagine it's coming sooner rather than later. Five times he's finished second since that win, including the last two weeks. Yeah, he's come very, very close. Uh, Dominic, we're not going to wait much longer to bring in our next guest, uh, a NASCAR legend in his own right. Tell us about Dave Marcus. So I'm going to do something a little different here. I usually introduce our guests, but I would regret it if I didn't pass this over to Jonathan Field, who arguably is not only a great historian of the sport, but knows even more and could do a better proper introduction. Right, Jonathan? Well, I was not expecting that, but I will I will take the moment. Thank you, Dom. <laughs> uh, so <clears throat> the guest we're about to have here, uh, well known for driving the number 71 throughout the years. Uh, the last a great independent owner driver. A uh, man of his day, he tested the number three car, Dale Earnhardt drove, all sorts of other cars, IROC cars. He's still working. He's still doing stuff. It is Dave Marcus. 
Good to have you on here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Absolutely. It, it was cool, Tyler. I talked with Dave earlier this week about coming on the show, and and, and I've never met Dave. I've never spoke with him and, and just called him, and he said, absolutely, this would be really cool to, to, to have on the show. And, yeah, not not every day you get a NASCAR legend on the show like we do with Dave Marcus. So so certainly wasting no time with it. Dave, thanks again for, for joining us this week. Dave, uh, tell us about where it, it all started for you. Where, where, where is the very beginning of your, your NASCAR journey uh, begin? Well, I, I raced in Wisconsin for 10 years on the short tracks, and, and I wanted to get involved in, in the racing business to make a living. And so when I look around, at, at, you know, USAC had stock cars and, and they had the Indy cars, you, you know, their, their stuff, some of it was pretty seasonal. And, and NASCAR starts racing in February and, and goes till November. And so I'm like, if I want to do this for a living, I'm going to have to go and see if I can do it in NASCAR. So uh, that's what started it. And uh, uh, Chris Economaki's National Speed Sport newspaper had an ad in it for a race car for sale. Uh, it was at Henley Gray's house in Rome, Georgia. It was owned by Don Biederman from uh, Canada. And uh, Larry called him up and talked to him about it and then told me about it. And Larry ended up buying the car. So I came down and picked it up and we went through the car and, you know, checked it all out and done a lot of work on it. And uh, went to Daytona to run an ARCA race first. And uh, in that ARCA race, uh, I think we were having a good run going, and the car I was drafting behind blew out the pressure plate, went through the front bumper on that 67 Chevelle of mine and through the radiator, knocked us out of the race. We were actually loading up our stuff to come home. And one of the NASCAR inspectors came over to the ARCA garage and said, are you guys interested in running in the Daytona 500? The entry blanks are still open until 5 o'clock today. And I said, wow, maybe. And so I talked to Larry Wears about it. And he thought, well, it's snowing in Wisconsin. What are we going to do up there? Now we, and so he, he said, you got to bring the car over here in the NASCAR garage and disassemble it and magnaflux it and put it through inspection. So we said, okay, we do that. And that was the start of it. And we qualified for that that first race, and uh, that was in 1968. I retired in 2002 at Daytona. That's incredible. Wow. So, yeah, so I ran 32 consecutive Daytona 500s, 33 total. I missed the race in 2000 and in 2001. Now, quite the storybook start and end. Like if you think about it, Dave, it's like a sandwich. You you have the cover and the back cover, and the, that would be Daytona and all these cool, cool things you got to do in that thirty plus year, forty plus year history in in the sport. So when when you think back on that time racing in the top series and for all the owners you got to race for, and and certainly doing it for yourself for a majority of that. What would you say sticks out to you the most, or or what are you? What would you say you're most proud of? Well, you know, I followed NASCAR the best I could up in Wisconsin, was a farm boy, and and I read uh, Hot Rod Magazine. Uh, that's the only magazine, I guess, that was available. They covered some NASCAR stuff. Um, the car I raced in Wisconsin, uh, my favorite color was always blue, and so I pulled for Richard Petty uh, as a youngster up there. Um, and that's, I guess, why I painted my, my car blue also. But the first person to come over and welcome me into NASCAR when we got over there on that side was Richard Petty. It was like a dream come true. <laughs> but but he come over and said, welcome to NASCAR. And he looked my car over and then he said, it's a pretty nice looking car. And, and he had seen the car, I think, previously when Don Biederman had run some NASCAR races with him. So that was that was pretty exciting for starting out. 
I, and, and I mean, just walk us through that first race, you know, like over your emotions, what was it like just being out there? Well, I mean, when I drove in there and through that tunnel and, and come out on the other side and you look down to the right and holy man, I mean, this place is huge. And, and I mean, even I was used to running, you know, third miles, quarter miles, three eight, stuff like that. A few half miles, but not many. Well, it was pretty unbelievable, really. Uh, I had ran a race at Atlanta, I think, in the fall of the fall of '67. Uh, that was a NASCAR Sportsman race, which James Hilton won that race. And I'm not sure where I finished in that race. Maybe like 18th or something. Uh, but I mean, it's. Uh, and Dick Trickle and I, he came with me. The first race I actually went to, two race in, was the race at Charlotte Motor Speedway in the fall of 67. And uh, we never got the car through NASCAR inspection. Um, so you know, we didn't make that race. And Dick Trickle came with me. And we didn't have enough money to get back to Wisconsin. We went up in the office and talked to Richard Howard. And he gave us $150 back to Wisconsin. Wow. <laughs> no strings attached or anything like that? <laughs> huh? No, no strings attached, didn't need to pay it back or anything? No. That, that's awesome. And you hear about that a lot too, Dave. I remember Jeff Bodine telling us a story about not making a race at Martinsville and, and the sanctioning body giving like tow money. So like if, if cars miss the field, at least, hey, well, you're not going to get some of the prize money, but here's a little bit of money to help you for your trouble and get you back home. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, it was nice of him. Well, I mean, we, I was just, we, we didn't have no money to get home. Between the two of us, we didn't have enough. So we slept in that tow truck a lot in those early days. I mean, I just, I don't give up. I just had a desire to get involved in NASCAR and, uh, and, uh, I like working. So, uh, pretty much most of my career, I did run as an independent when I had the opportunities or people needed a relief driver. Uh, I done that. And, and when I was in a competitive car, I think I proved that I was capable. Uh, I guess, you know, I drove relief for Bobby Isaac in 71, I believe when he had them kidney stones. And I pretty much had that race won at Talladega, and with uh, six laps remaining, we blew an engine up in the car. And I, I have a, a drove relief for Richard Petty. I drove relief for Bobby Allison at Bristol and ended up winning the race. I think I ran the car like 169 laps and won that race. Um, I drove the Woods Brothers car uh, for Donnie Allison when he needed relief at Atlanta one time. So, uh, I've been in a lot of good race cars. Certainly so. And, and one thing, too, I think when you think about your career, Dave, you've raced against a majority of NASCAR Cup Series champions from Richard Petty, Dale Earnhardt, Cale Yarborough, David Pearson to Jeff Gordon, Rusty Wallace, a lot of good names over the years. When, when you think on those guys and, and maybe even just open it up in general, who would you say – and, and maybe there's some obvious ones. Maybe there isn't. Who were some of your toughest competitors? Or who who gave you a, a hassle on the racetrack when you knew you were racing beside them that you were going to really earn your money racing them? Well, I mean, I respected all them guys. I was just a, a nobody coming down here and trying to run with these guys. So I respected them. I tried to stay out of trouble. But, you know, I think David Pearson really is one guy that stands out to me that, I always felt comfortable racing alongside of David Pearson when you could could run with him. In those days, it was the race pretty much between David Pearson and Richard Petty. And I always felt like if I couldn't beat him, if I could at least run with him or close to him, you would be guaranteed a pretty good finish. I mean, that's that's incredible. You know, and like just... Talk about those those opportunities, just getting to like getting those cars, like getting to like work with it. Like, uh, what was the conversation like beforehand? What did they talk to you about? Well, I 
uh, you know, some of those deals, there was no talking time. Like I was in that race with my own car and something happened and I dropped out and like with Bobby Allison situation at Bristol and they come running over there and Hey, Bobby's getting sick in the car. It was an extremely hot day and uh, we need you to drive the car. We need somebody for relief. Get your helmet on and, and you know, and they run back to her pit and, and I, and I get on the, in the car and end up winning the race. And a similar situation at Darlington one time, uh, I I actually ran Richard up in the wall coming off of turn two. Uh, that was in the old layout of the racetrack. And uh, I didn't know he was outside of me, but it, it bent the front end up on his car, and he was having a tough time driving it. And I ended up dropping out. And when I did, the first person over there was Dale Inman. And he said, you get your damn helmet on. He said, you wrecked that car and you got Richards wore out trying to drive it. You get your butt over here and get in it. He needs relief. And, um, so, so I run over there and got in Richards car. And when we switched drivers, uh, Dale worked on the front end a little bit and got, got the towing squared away. And, um, I think I got back up to fourth or fifth place with the car and then it rained. And after the rain, the car just didn't run good. It got really tight and picked up too much push. Uh, we finished the race. I don't remember exactly where, but uh, anyhow, up till that point, we, you know, we were really moving forward. It looked really good. And so I want to take, I want you to take us to 1975 and this awesome season you had driving the 71 car. A few years before Bobby Isaac races that to the championship and Harry Hyde's atop the pit box and you have Harry as your crew chief. You guys had a lot of close calls on winning some races and, and you did finish runner up in points, but you finally broke through and won that Martinsville race for that first career win. So was that maybe the pinnacle or just getting things started? Just take us back to how that felt to, to finally cross that off and win your first cup race. Well, it was big. I mean, any time that you could win a race, I mean, I know the sport's competitive today, but it also was then. Maybe there's more, they're all more equal now than they were then, but there still was 16 very, very competitive cars back at that time too, and the next group wasn't that bad off. But uh, to finally get a win, it, it's a big, big deal. And uh, that K&K &K insurance car was always competitive, and I, I think the biggest problem, uh, when I started driving that car, that was when, you know, they had to start running at the other engines. The Hemis got outlawed. And so we were very, very competitive, but we did have a lot of motor problems or engine problems with the car and not due to the mechanics working on it or Randy Dorton's work. It was the parts that we were had to use from Chrysler Corporation, the cylinder heads, to get competitive. They really had to pour them, grind them in more than what they really wanted to to get maximum horsepower to be competitive. So it got us competitive, but it also cost us a lot of breakdowns. We were pulling the rocker arm studs, that would, the boss and the cylinder head that supported them, it would, be, it would pull right up out of the casting. And the castings that Chrysler had at that time just weren't adequate. And so uh, Randy and the guys at the shop, uh, they were having to weld them cylinder heads up and braze them and try and make them work. So we dropped out of many, many races with that problem, which, which like I say, it wasn't, it wasn't the engine guy's fault. It was the parts that was available at that time to the race teams. I heard you mention, you said Randy Dorton, right? Yes, sir. Wow. I, yeah, I mean, Randy was. Yeah. Incredible engine builder. Yes. Very good. Yeah. And I look at your time too. You drove for Rod Osterlin and drove the two car before Dale Earnhardt took it over. And again, strong runs there too, that you had with him a lot more often in the top five and top 10 than not. And, and competing for a championship in 78. So, I mean, of course, winning races is, is so important and competing for championships, but, and did you, how was that? Like that being on that week to week grind, knowing you had a chance to win every week to go lead laps and compete for a championship. I mean, that, it must've been pretty exciting to know that 
you roll off that holler, you're going to have a chance to win because not every team has that opportunity. Yeah, well, I mean, that was a, that was a good ride to drive for, but um, we we were running second in the points, I think, with um, maybe three races remaining that year. I think we had Rockingham, Atlanta, and Ontario left, and they fired my crew chief, Roland Wolodica, Wil- fired Dewey Livengood, who was the crew chief. And I called Mr. Osterlund, and he wouldn't accept my phone call. And I wanted to know what was going on and why did they fire the crew chief. And I was very upset about it. Um, so we went to Rockingham, and they didn't hardly talk to me there. I drove the car there. Uh, we went to it. The next race was Atlanta. And um, I, it just bothered me and worked on me. Why would you fire a guy that's a a new first year team running second in the points with three races left and you fire his crew chief. So um, at Atlanta, after qualifying, I went up in the press box and told the press that I was quitting Osterlin racing. And, uh, and then when I went back to the motel, I called the wife and told her, I'm calling you early because I'm not going to answer that telephone tonight. Cause probably when Rod Osterlin hears that, he's going to be trying to get a hold of me. And uh, that phone did ring in the motel quite a few times, but I did not answer it. And and just just you know, and then a lot of people said, "Well, he quit because Dale was coming aboard." That had nothing to do with it. Not absolutely nothing. Dale Earnhardt and I were good friends. Um, that that didn't have a thing to do with it. Tyler, I just that, don't think that. they treated Dewey Live and Good right. Tyler, that is like the ultimate boss move to to quit like that. Oh, it is. <laughs> it is. That, that's great. Oh, yeah. Dave Marcus that joining is. us this week here on Let's Go Racing. Dave, uh, what would you say is your biggest accomplishment? What, what are you most proud of from your career? Well, I, I just think that I always race, no matter how, how good I was that particular day. If I was running 30th, I was racing – as hard as I could with what I had to get to 29th or or wherever it was. And I I put a 100% effort into it all the time, every race. And and, uh, I I don't believe in giving up. And I think that that when I got in competitive cars, I showed that I was capable of driving them. And uh, I've always been honest with everybody and treat people like I want to be treated. And I had a lot, a lot of respect from race fans and yet today you could hardly believe how many autograph requests that I still get from race fans from back in the, in those days. It's, I can't hardly believe it myself, but uh, some weeks, some weeks I'll probably sign 25 autographs of them little cards that we have. I call them baseball cards, but um, people send them in the envelopes We'll return the envelope with the address and postage on to have you sign them. So I just, I put a lot of effort into what I done. I enjoyed what I done. I worked hard, but it's what I wanted to do. And I think that honesty bled through a lot too over the years. I, race fans have good BS detectors. They know when a driver is genuine, when a driver may not be. And, and I think a lot of fans definitely saw that over the years and, and doing that as an independent team owner and, and doing it your way. And I, I think that's, that is something a lot of people can certainly get behind. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm proud of it. I We had to improvise a lot of times, and we didn't have money to buy the best tires, but Goodyear did always help me out some, um, which meant a lot. I wouldn't have made it without it. And, uh, you know, like in, in the IROC cars, I did for like 31 years. So the money I got paid from Roger Penske for testing IROC cars helped me keep my cup team going. And uh, Mark Donahue uh, originally is the one that asked me to come to work to help test the IROC cars. So, uh, and then, then I had the privilege of, of testing for Dale after we lost Neil in that accident at Daytona. And uh, I, I'm honored to have tested the car and, and helped do the setup and stuff on it that Dale finally won the Daytona 500 with. So uh, I had a lot of respect for Dale. Man, that that's incredible. And I mean, just first of all, I'm curious, 
did you get a ring for, you know, the 500, your efforts, anything like that, you know? No, no, no ring. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> That's still cool, though. Man. <laughs> Richard, I... when I retired, Richard took me on a nice hunting trip out to British Columbia. I, I would say it's a pretty good console. It, that's pretty good too. That's pretty good. But man, I yeah, I, mean, I got a moose. Yeah. I got a moose out there, and I got a, a caribou out there, and a sheep, and yeah, and it was great. And Dale, Dale thanked me in, in victory circle. So I mean, that right there was worth a million bucks. Absolutely, man. And I mean, just being like a guy who's called upon to shake down the car to you know test to do things like that i mean that, that just kind of speaks to just you know the trust i guess they had in you well i had a good feel for for race cars and and there actually were weeks when between the little testing that i did with my car but then doing the ira cars and then doing dale's car that i actually was in a race car seven days a week yeah. Wow. I know that one time cool. we we ran Pocono, and uh, Dale had a test at, that Monday at Indianapolis, and Richard said you you just fly home with me and stay at my house tonight, and then we'll fly to Indy in the morning. So uh, so that's what we did, and uh, I was busy all the time. I mean, every day if I help with somebody or working on my own stuff. There you go. And before we came on the show, you were telling us that you, you try to go to Talladega as often as you can, and you, you've been to some of these other racetracks. But but how closely do you still follow the sport now? I know it's been 22 years since you've been behind the wheel, but do you still follow it really close? Do you stay in touch with any of your former competitors or current competitors? Well, I, I see Bobby Allison, and, and I've seen Richard at a race I went to, Petty and Childress. Um, but... Uh, Bobby and Donnie, I see occasionally. They're pretty much the only ones. Um, you know, and, and I've only gone to like five races since I retired in 2002. Uh, so, I mean, uh, it's, it, it, and I, I watched some, but uh, I'm not glued to the television. There's too darn many ads. And, and uh, it's, um, I don't know. To me, it's not racing like we raced. I don't like the stages at all. And most race fans that I talk to don't either. I don't like the fact that they give you a free lap if you get a lap down. Uh, when we were a lap down, uh, we, we had to sometimes give up doing a pit stop so we could restart on the inside line up front. And, and try and get the jump on the green flag and hope that they had a wreck the first lap and you could get your lap back. And, and it wasn't always easy, but we had to earn it. I had to work for it. You had to earn it. Uh, you know, one of my big problems, uh, I was always quite competitive, but as the race went on, I was less competitive because I was running used tires. And when they get them cautions and everybody gets new tires, it's tough keeping up on used tires, but generally in the latter stages of the race, I could keep up with the other cars, but I just didn't have new tires. Generally when I lost the lap, it would be in the earlier parts of the race because sometimes starting on used tires and them guys had stickers. It's a big difference. Yeah. And yeah, you, you've had some really cool experiences across your NASCAR career. You got to do a lot of really, really cool things. Sounds like you're going to have to like write a book about all your experiences someday, Dave. To do what? You're going to have to write a book, like like a tell-all book, getting to race for some of these big days. Yeah, everybody says that. I, you know, you. I guess it would be good. Like you'd have to have a, spend a lot of time with somebody. I mean, there's a lot of things that when you're talking about other stuff, you think of other things. So uh, it would take a while. I mean, I have 35 years in NASCAR, 10 years short tracks in Wisconsin before that, 45 years of racing. Yeah. So, yeah, there's a lot of things, a lot of stories. I've seen many, many changes in NASCAR. Uh, yeah, it's... Uh, 
it's hard to remember them all, you know, but when you're talking about certain things, you start remembering other stuff too. So yeah. it's, uh, uh, and the first race at Talladega, I, I remember that race when, when everybody left, I left with them because <clears throat> I was a brand new guy on the circuit. And, and I felt like if I stay here and race and I'm tr- I want to stay in this for a living and, and try and make it, everybody here is going to be mad at me. Richard Petty, David Pearson, Buddy Baker. I mean, everybody in the sport. How am I ever going to make it? And at that time, the race car I had was owned by Milt Lunda. He owned Lunda Construction Company in Black River Falls, Wisconsin, and they they, they built bridges for the federal government. And uh, I called Milt and told him, and he said, well, I don't approve of you leaving. He said, we've sent an entry blank in, and we're responsible, you know, to be there. Well, I told him I understood that, but uh, everybody else was leaving too, and they sent entry blanks in. So I went against his word, and and I left with everybody else. And, uh, you know, you look at it two ways. Maybe I should have stayed, but but then I I felt like, how could you make it in a sport if everybody hated you before you ever really got started? That was only my second year. So... And I didn't run that many races in 68. You know, I didn't run all the races. So th- that's that's why I left. And 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 later on, I, I sat down and talked with Mr. France Sr. And I told him my side of the story. And he said, I understand your situation. And when I was driving the K&K insurance car, and I don't remember if this, I believe it was in 75, one day he came in the garage driving through the road in his car and he said, what are you doing? Have you got a free hour or hour and a half? I said, yeah. Um, I said, you know, there's no practice, I guess, for an hour and a half or two hours. He said, can you leave? I said, sure. He said, hop in the car. He took me over to a clothing store down in uh, by the racetrack. I think it was in Lincoln, Alabama and took me inside there and told the lady in there, you give him a new pair of dress pants and a sports coat and a nice shirt and put it on my bill. And and I always said to myself, I, I think that he understood my story and he forgive me for leaving that racetrack. He he knew my situation. I mean, I mean, I wanted to race and, and even more so with all the good guys gone, but, uh, I just decided that wasn't the right thing to do. Now, uh, with oh. that, with that, with with that shopping trip, was there a pair of wingtip shoes and a Goodyear hat involved in there? <laughs> <laughs> no, it was it was new dress pants and a shirt and a sport coat. <laughs> yeah. I, I always say that just because I mean, when, when people look back, I guess on your time of the sport, like. Those are two things that instantly stand out about, I guess, just your look, you know? Well, the wingtip shoes, the, the wingtip shoes came about uh, when Bobby Allison burned his feet really, really bad one time, and I think it might have been Bristol. The morning of the race at North Wilkesboro, Richard Petty, Cale Yarbrough, myself, and, uh, and uh, David Pearson were standing on pit road talking, and Bobby Allison was coming up pit road. He could hardly walk. He was limping. And I said something about, boy, poor Bobby, his feet's burnt so bad he can hardly walk. And David Pearson said, what are you wearing for shoes? And, and I guess it was just a, a pair of tennis shoes or something. And he said, don't you have any shoes with leather soles? I said, I do. Well, I said, they're my dress shoes. They're wingtips. Well, he said, where are they? I said, they're out in the trunk of the car in the infield because, you know, we stayed in a motel. And... uh he said, well, go get them and wear them today. So I wore them that day at North Wilkesboro, and I didn't burn my the heels on my feet. And I just kept wearing them after that. And then all the race fans picked up on it. I can go somewhere now and sign autographs like at the Stocks for Tots that Don Miller has in Mooresville every year. And those race fans will lift that tablecloth up on that table and want to see if I have them wingtips on. They don't forget. 
Oh man, that's hilarious. That's great. Yeah, it's it. Yeah, it's uh, it's amazing. It really is. So so I always wear them now when I go to them autograph sessions. <laughs> Very cool. Dave, uh, we got plenty more that we want to get to here with you uh, while you're on the show. We want to get to some headlines in the sport and get your opinion on a couple things here. Uh, Dominic, uh, let's uh, let's go ahead and get started. Where do we want to get to first? Let's get started with a NASCAR driver making a debut this weekend under unfortunate circumstances with Corey Heim taking the will of the number 43. Toyota with Legacy Motor Club. Eric Jones suffered his, his back injury at Talladega with that crash late in the race and ended up announcing on social media on Tuesday, April 23rd, that he would be out for at least one race with Dover. Corey Heim, the reserve driver who runs in the truck series and Xfinity series, will take the wheel of the number 43 car, but Tyler certainly making a debut, but not in the best of circumstances. Yeah, uh, excited for Corey Heim. He's a talented race car driver and big opportunity for him, but Eric Jones, uh, a guy that's trying to make the playoff and everything, he can't afford to be missing races. This isn't good for him. Dave, uh, let me ask you, like, Eric Jones having to step out of the seat due to injury this week, like, that, that that's a tough thing, isn't it, for, for a driver to be watching somebody else drive their car, I imagine. Yes, it is. It's very tough. That time I got my leg broke uh, in Daytona, um, I, I used Jim Sauter a couple times uh, in my car. I started it so I could get the points and as quick as we got a caution, I put Jim in it. But yeah, it's real tough. It's it, You can't believe, I mean, and then being the independent owner operator, I think even made it tougher. Yeah. That, I think that was, that was the time that uh, Dale Earnhardt took AJ Foyt's car out in a late practice. It was uh, the 4th of July race. And they had changed the rear gear, and that A.J. Foyt had to go somewhere for a meeting. Uh, and so they had Dale and practice the car after they made a gear change. And the rear end plug came out and sprayed grease all over the racetrack. I believe Terry Labonte hit it first and wrecked, and Darrell Waltrip. And then I hit it and spun around and went into Darrell backwards. So he had a broken leg. I had a broken leg. I'm not sure if Terry's was broke, but he had leg injuries also, all three of us. Um, and I actually got the, uh, I couldn't, well, Les Rector said I couldn't run the race because I had a cast on. I did not have a cast on my leg. They could not make their mind up at the hospital if my leg was or was not broke. They thought it was, but they weren't sure. And Les Rector said to me, he said, uh, well, then, if it's not broke, walk over here to me. He was at the leaning against the garage that morning before the race. And, uh, and I did walk over to him and it was really, really painful, but there wasn't much he could say. Then they let me start the race. I, we had sent the state patrols after JD McDuffie. He had left the racetrack that morning to head back home. And I had the state trooper down there, one of the motorcycle guys, make some calls, and they caught J.D. up by Jacksonville and got him to come back. And I put J.D. in the car to drive relief for me. So I started the race, and that's the year they had the big, big wreck right off the trial on the front straightaway on the first lap. So I started in the back, so I made it through the wreck. I came around slow, and, of course, they red flagged the race. And then J.D. got in the car, so I really didn't end up having to uh, drive the car any more than that one lap. And J.D. did finish the race for us that day. How about that? Uh, that's unique. Uh, Jonathan, uh, the, the situation there with the 43, tell me your thoughts kind of, uh, about Eric Jones having to step out and your expectations for Corey Heim. Well, one thought I have is uh, very interesting that the State Patrol ran down J.D. McDuffie so that way he could fill in for Dave back in the day. That's a great story. Um, but, yeah, I, I mean, circumstances involving, you know, Corey Heim getting to fill in for Eric Jones. I mean, we've seen this before with another Eric, with Eric Amarola, you know, having Bubba Wallace fill in, and that eventually, you know, led to Bubba getting that 43 car and, 
you know, it was 2017 when it happened, 2018, he got the 43 ride. I mean, very different circumstances, of course, but, you know, we've talked a lot about Corey Heim, you know, being a prospect in the sport, you know, we've seen a couple drivers, you know, make their way from, you know, trucks to cup. Maybe this could be, you know, a path where Corey kind of gets to show his, what he's capable of, you know, Josh Berry's in our example of how, you know, a driver was able to show what he was capable of in a really tough situation and prove his worth. So it's going to be a good weekend, or I guess not necessarily good, but a valuable weekend for Corey, I think. Yeah, I, I, I think so. And it, uh, Legacy Motor Club uh, hasn't been great uh, to start this year. Last year, they really struggled. Uh, just getting an, another driver in that seat will be uh, good for them to get some feedback. I'd imagine so. And, and and maybe he can bring something, a different perspective, maybe that rookie perspective on, on let's, Hey, let's try this under the hood or let's try this with a setup. Maybe a new voice could help. Certainly it's going to, I feel like Tyler, we saw this with Alex Bowman last year. We saw this with Chase Elliott. You get removed from that car and you come back, even if you're hundred percent or not, that has killed any momentum that you have made or any gains that you have made as a team. So I got to imagine anything that Eric Jones and, and team have made any strides in the right direction will probably be erased when he comes back. What else going on, Dom? So speaking of teams, and and we know the sport is very, very dependent on sponsorship, as are the race teams. And and one of the moves out of the sports business journal earlier this week, Adam Stern reporting that Kroger could be on the move for a new team and another shakeup in 2025 with a possible chain of events going on here. So Kroger has been a longtime partner of JTG Doherty Racing. They've been a mostly single car operation since their existence in Cup. They've run... A uh, second car on occasion and over the years, but mostly just the 47 team. And Kroger has been a big part of that and, and their message since at least 2010. So looking like this could jump to Joe Gibbs Racing. And it, it also begs the question, Tyler, if the sponsorship's leaving, could the charter be leaving too? Yeah, uh, it's been a great partnership. Kroger has loved Ricky Stenhouse Jr. I remember when they won the Daytona 500 last year, guys were there and the Kroger folks were saying that they didn't want to work with anybody other than Ricky Stenhouse. They loved their partnership. And, uh, you know, the, the JTG team family run organization, uh, you know, really it, it'd be unfortunate if that were the case. Uh, Dave, Dave, let me, let me ask you, you know, you, you know how important sponsorship is. I mean, uh, it'd just be heartbreaking if a team like JTG were, to lose a big sponsor like Kroger here to, to a team like Joe Gibbs Racing. I mean, uh, they, they certainly need it more than Joe Gibbs does. Yeah, I mean, sponsors are very, very important. You cannot do it without them. And, and nowadays, I guess it's worse, you know, than in my era of the sport. But, but you have to have them. You got to have them. Yeah. Um, Jonathan, uh, the – the repercussions, the downward spiral effect here. If if JTG loses Kroger to Joe Gibbs Racing, what do you think would play out next? Is that the end of JTG Racing as we know? Would you expect that charter to be sold? Well, and what's interesting, it you mentioned that you know Sports Business Journal was also mentioning that Tagga Schechter could go over there and take up some sort of role with JGR. So I mean, when you have one of the key owners jumping ship with a sponsor i mean huh the the writing's on the wall i mean it, it, it's it's grim almost you know and and that kind of opens the door for you know maybe t- this is the way toyota a toyota team could get a charter 2311's been looking for a charter you know open up a third team they got that new shop maybe this is the opportunity you know i, I mean legacy motor club obviously like they are just getting their feet wet with toyota and just getting on the ground, you know, maybe that could be an opportunity. Who knows? I mean, it's definitely a a really interesting wrinkle in the silly season. And I mean, it'd be a tough break for, I think Ricky Stiles Jr. Cause just looking at the lineup of drivers that is over there at Toyota. I mean, the Toyota pipeline is full that I just, yeah, I think it'd be a very tough situation for Ricky. Yeah. He would certainly be the odd man out. I don't know if he'd have another cup ride, to be honest. That's the unfortunate circumstance the way to unfold uh that way and dominic just real quick on this i mean the way the charter system's going 
these don't open up too often. I mean, now we've seen the price skyrocket because the demand is so high for these chargers that if we're lucky, maybe one, maybe two are sold every single year. We talk about the Toyota camps. I mean, we've heard Dale Jr.'s name be mentioned. Um, we know about the Andretti's being, you know, looking to get in NASCAR. I mean, it's not just the Toyota teams. There'll be plenty of teams. I mean, track house, for example, that would be interested in a charter. Oh, yeah, and it would go to the highest bidder. And I think just the only variable on that whole situation, we don't have a charter agreement for next year. So I, I think I was telling you, Tyler, that right now, B.J. McLeod looks like a superhero for selling his. Now, he could be looking like maybe five years from now, oh, no, B.J. McLeod was holding the bag because the value just went so much higher. Or this thing crashes down and doesn't happen. Well, we don't have a charter agreement. It really seems like it could go either way at this time because the further we go into the year, we, we are going into unknown, uncharted, no pun intended, territory with all that. What could happen with the situation? It, it, it's so, so It can go so many ways, Tyler. We're just going to have to see how this all unfolds. Yeah, uh, to be continued, as they say. Uh, Dominic, uh, what's the odds look like for Dover this week? So we got the Worth 400 from Dover International Speedway this upcoming weekend. And, of course, your odds, courtesy of the RacingExperts.com and Jonathan Field here. Some of the odds, some of your odds on favorites heading into this Sunday's race. Maybe a surprise, no surprise. Kyle Larson sitting at 4.5 to 1 or plus 450. Martin Truex Jr., last year's winner of this race that ran on a Monday, sitting at plus 650. William Byron, Ross Chastain, Danny Hamlin at plus 750 or seven and a half to one. Christopher Bell at 10 to one. Chase Elliott at 11 to one. Last year's champion, Ryan Blaney, sits at 13 to one. Ty Gibbs, who has yet to win a race at 16 to one. And past Dover winner, Alex Bowman, also joining him at 16 to one. But I, I don't know. I haven't seen the forecast, but I would like to also know what the odds are that we race on Sunday. That's the million dollar question these days. Dave, uh, Tell me about Dover. What's uh, what's the challenge ahead for these drivers here racing at, at at Dover Motor Speedway? Well, it's a tough racetrack. I mean, it it gets your attention every lap for sure, and the heat there, depending on what the outside temperature is, but it's a hot place, similar to Bristol. Uh, so you gotta you gotta keep your concentration all day long. It's a long race. Is it still five hundred miles or five? Yeah, five hundred miles yet. Four hundred. Or has it 400. been reduced? 400 okay well well we had 500 there but uh it's a tough racetrack it's i mean it's uh it's very very demanding very demanding the main thing i guess is you got to keep your concentration yeah yeah that's a great point uh i'm going with william byron uh i i think that he's the guy to beat about every given week uh at this point, I'm going with Byron. Jonathan, give me your pick. Who do you like? You know, uh, even if it's not a Monday, I will still go with Martin Truex Jr. He's so good at this track, leads all drivers in active wins. So I think Martin Truex Jr. Dominic? I got to go with Jonathan on that one. He won last year. I think he's just he's going to break through and win that first race like he did in 2023. He was so close a lot last year. He's been oh so closer this year. He breaks through and wins this race on Sunday or Monday. Time for our mailbag segment. We ask you to submit questions to us uh, via email, davidstarpodcast at gmail.com. Also on X at Star Podcast, facebook.com slash starpodcast. You can uh, send us your questions each and every week. Dave, our first question in the mailbag comes from James and Padarico. Uh, he writes, Dave, what made you decide to hang it up and what are you up to now? Well, the reason I hung it up is I couldn't afford to keep going. I mean, it's, uh, again, there comes a sponsor deal you guys were talking about. Um, I had a pretty good career, but it was getting very difficult to uh, run that schedule without having an airplane, and I certainly couldn't even think about having an airplane. So it, it was just getting tougher and tougher all the time. And what I'm doing now is, uh, like I say, I got a big garden, I got a dump truck, I got a backhoe, I cut firewood, um, I do a few things at the shop, I try and get a fishing trip in there, turkey hunting, um, deer hunting, so uh, I'm staying busy. Sounds like you got a lot going around. on. My goodness. What, what, what do you enjoy doing the most in, uh, in your free time? Fishing and hunting. 
Yeah. I like that. He's spoken like a true Midwesterner. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, uh, you know, I, I mean, I, I, I work all my life, and I, I guess I relax more when I work than if I sit around. I'm, I'm just not a guy to sit around. I, I, there's some days here this television doesn't even get turned on. There's something to do. Now, now, are you driving your family crazy when when you're sticking sticking around at home, uh, relaxing? Did, did, are they pushing you to get out the door? Well, I'm not always here. I go over to the shop and help out a little bit there, work on some of my own stuff, um, working out in the field. Um, like I say, I plant a big garden, so that takes a lot of time. Uh, I mean, I raise I raise potatoes and corn and beans and beets and carrots and peas and okra and uh, I mean a big garden, cabbages and carrots, and, and it takes a lot of time. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure. Dave, uh, another question in the uh, mailbag for you. This comes from Lance in Idaho. He wants to know, what NASCAR city has the best food? The best food? <laughs> yes. Well, in my era of the sport, we always try to find buffets. So you could eat all you all you want. Uh, and if you were wanting seafood in, in those days, a Dover, Delaware, I had a, or several restaurants um, that had great seafood. And I, I recall one night Richard Petty and I and Maurice went to a seafood restaurant. We ordered our food, and, and those people were coming over to the table wanting Richard's autograph. And Maurice and I were kind of there sitting there waiting, waiting on Richard. Finally, Maurice said, hey. Let's eat, because he ain't going to get to eat. And Richard was signing autographs just about the whole time. Oh, that's that's hilarious. So uh, what, what, what do you like to eat, uh, Dave? What, what are your favorite foods? I'm not fussy. I like roast beef, lobster, shrimp, porterhouse steaks, potatoes. It's, it, and all in all, day in and day out, it's pretty hard to beat a good homemade roast beef with carrots and potatoes and gravy. It's, oh, yeah. that's some cover food to right there. Yeah, you're you're speaking, <laughs> you're speaking Jonathan's language here. Yeah, that's good on a cold yeah. day. <laughs> yeah, uh, so, but I've always been a good eater. <laughs> what about you guys? What what, what are the, some of the places, uh, Jonathan? I'll start with you. Some of the favorite places you've been uh, that you've uh, enjoyed uh, eating at. Oh, man, I have to go to the place where we all came together the first time, Kansas City. Man, the barbecue, I mean, you know, Oklahoma City Joe's, you know, go to the gas station location, the barbecue, everything. Oh, man, slice of heaven. What about you, Tyler? Man, um, it, it varies. You know, it's all it's it's so different everywhere you go. Uh, you know, I I. I Always have a, a soft spot for for Kansas City, you know, eating that Kansas City barbecue. Of course, that's that's a great one. Um, but you know, you you, you got to get just based on where you're at, right? Like if you're in Alabama, you got to go get some fried chicken. If you're you know in uh, Daytona or, or Homestead, Miami, you know, got to get some seafood and such. I, I think a big key to it, uh, I would say, Jonathan is what the local special is like don't don't try to be cute and order a burger or something like go go with what you know or a salad dom um i'm so sorry <laughs> yeah um, i had the mistake of ordering salad at a, at a barbecue joint but i will say that did make me wait wait, wait what 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 the hell yep oh you don't know it. oh yeah so the long story short this is 2017 went to kansas speedway dave you're going to be disappointed me too on this like I wasn't the biggest fan of barbecue sauce at the time. We go to KC Joe's, arguably one of the best barbecue joints in the country. And I'm just not really warm to the idea of having barbecue sauce. But I go with the group and I order a salad with some chicken on it. And everybody's giving me crap at dinner. And they're like, you need to at least try some of that barbecue sauce on some of that grilled chicken on your salad. And I did. And it was like an aha moment, like a fireworks in the mouth. moment. like, wow, this stuff's actually pretty good. This is what I've been missing this whole time. And now, all these years later, last time I was in Kansas City, 
he had me bring home a gallon of Oklahoma City, Kansas City Joe's barbecue sauce. So his tastes have changed. There we go. Yes. Yeah, Dave, are you a fan of barbecue sauce? Yeah. Uh, we got a gentleman up here. Uh, he's got a small barbecue place it's called Bubba, and uh, he has great barbecue. Great barbecue. Okay. Try it next time we're up in that area, guys. Yeah, there we go. Uh, before we uh, kind of wrap up here, uh, let's uh, let's go around the room a second here. Dave, we appreciate you joining us, man. What's uh, what's kind of the – take us, give us a glimpse into your world. What's kind of the next uh, few days, next week or so look like uh, for you, man? Well, tomorrow I plan on working in the garden. Uh, Thursday I hope that we get to go fishing. Um. Friday, I'm not sure exactly what we got going yet. Sounds like a good time. That sounds nice. Uh, I, I don't know about working in the garden and all that, but I like the idea of going fishing. That sounds like a good time. Um, Jonathan, what's the planet? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Jonathan, what's what's uh, what's going on with you, man? Well, uh, today, of course, uh, posted latest news. Corey Heim, you know, also. Posted the odds and the need to know information on the racingexpress.com. Also posted about the uh, NASCAR All Star Race format. Um, you're just gonna have to go read about that on there. There's a lot to break down, and we got it all simplified, broken down for you. Uh, we got some great stuff coming up on the racingexpress.com. Don probably talk about that a little bit more, but uh, yeah, just uh, going over things from Talladega and previewing Dover, and of course my day job at KOB4, KOB.com, KOB NBC Albuquerque. So. Very good. Dominic, how about... Yeah, just staying busy. Like, Jonathan, we it, it's really cool. You know, I, I'm not going to give away tra trade secrets here, and I know other organizations do things different, but we've gone back to the basics of what we do at the website, and I think it just it works. For the, sometimes less is more to, to how we communicate with our team, so we're just keeping up the coverage with, with our motorsports coverage at theracingexperts.com, and we don't have anybody on site at Dover this weekend, but we will at some of the races in May, and yeah, really, really fun time covering the sport, Tyler. How about you? What do you got the next few days? Uh, I am knee deep into working the NFL draft uh, this weekend. Um, I'm exhausted already just thinking about it. Uh, but <laughs> it'll be a, it'll be a great time. It is as a sports fan. If you're an NFL fan, this this week is so unique because it's the only week of the entire year where every single fan base, every single team has hope, has belief. <laughs> or everything is okay until it's not okay. And so it's a great time to celebrate the league, celebrate the sport, um, and feel optimistic at least for one weekend. And then reality sets in when it all uh, comes to a screeching halt for some teams uh, by Sunday. So that is uh, that is my world this weekend. Uh, I'm going to be uh, very – plugged in and uh, working the NFL drafts. So I'm certainly looking forward to it. D Dave, are, are, are you a football fan at all? Who, who, who's kind of your football team? Dave, you there? Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, my football team, uh, Green Bay Packers. Oh, I knew there was something I liked about you, Dave. I'm a Packers fan myself from New Mexico. Well, oh. I used to, years and years ago, I, I pulled for the Washington Redskins when Joe Gibbs was the uh, coach. Oh, yeah. There you go. Man. Joe Gibbs and multi-championship. It seems like it, down here, uh, because North Carolina no, in those years didn't have a football team, there were a lot of Green Bay Packer fans. Yeah. That warms my heart hearing that, Tyler. Oh, man. I, man, there's a bit of this on an hour now. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Oh, that's, uh, that's great. Uh, Dave, we appreciate you joining us, man. Uh, you're welcome back, uh, anytime. Thanks for, thanks for stopping by and be a part of the show this week, man. All right. Thanks for having me on and hello to all the race fans. There you go. Dave Mark is joining us here on let's go racing this week. We'll put the checkered flag out on this edition of let's go racing. We'll be back and do it all again next week. Make sure to subscribe to the show. New episodes out each and every week on Apple, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and YouTube. Leave us a five-star review or don't leave us one at all. You can also hit us up on social media, X at Star Podcast, uh, Facebook.com slash Star Podcast. You can also email us, davidstarpodcast at gmail.com. For Davidak Aragon, 
Jonathan Fell, Dave Marcus, our entire crew. I'm Tyler Jones saying so long. It's been another edition of Let's Go Racing. We shall see you next week.